field of study. In particular, he was an original member of the advisory council of the Ivy International Center for Health Innovation at Western University and the steering committee of the Center for the Advancement of Health Innovation within the Continental Board of Canada, and was a member of the board of directors of the Institute of Health Economics in Edmonton. Previously a partner in the Toronto office of the law, the law firm Tories LLP, Bill's practice included mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance, securities, law, and public-private partnerships. He formed and was head of the privacy law group. Uh, he also worked in Ottawa on a wide range of justice public policy issues, including those related, related to health care, human rights, constitutional law, and criminal law. So thanks to the support of our three foundations and of the uh, HSN Volunteer Association, the speaker's series is possible, so I want to acknowledge their support. And without further ado, please welcome Bill Kravinsky. Uh, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I really, I'm quite disappointed that I wasn't able to get up there. And the part that's even a bit more surprising is it was actually due to the weather in Toronto, not Sudbury. We had a ridiculous windstorm last night with uh, winds of, uh, uh, yesterday, sorry, of winds up to 100 kilometers an hour. It was a bit uh, crazy. Um, so I, uh, I'm really glad to be at least uh, presenting to you. Our intent originally was to be in Sudbury and get to see uh, HSN and um, and hear more, I guess, from people on the ground about the strategic planning exercise, um, the work you've done on innovation so far. It's always much, much better to, uh, to have these discussions in person. Um, and I've been a big believer from the very beginning of this job that I should not be sitting in this office, uh, uh, you know, most of the week. If I am, I'm doing something wrong. So uh, anyway, please, uh, I guess, I don't know if I apologize for the weather, but uh, I, I uh, wish I had been able to get there. So um, I want to do uh, three things today. I want to reinforce a message that, um, to be very honest, I, I kind of see this as a bully pulpit for, and that is to, to talk to everybody about health being an economic driver. Uh, it is uh, far past time where we should be leveraging the massive state investment in Canada, let alone Ontario, in healthcare as an economic driver. Uh, it is entirely consistent with what the rest of the world is doing. It's entirely consistent with improved patient outcomes. It's entirely consistent with optimizing the impact of the in, uh, innovation investment, frankly, the healthcare investment we're making in this country. So if you take away nothing from else from today, health is an economic driver. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we're two and a half years in our work. Um, Lots of people are telling us we've really had impact, and I'm going to share some of that with you. Uh, and in the context of the strategic planning work that you're doing, um, and leave time at the end for conversation, uh, because I, uh, I really think that, uh, like, I'm a big believer in listening and learning. So hopefully, we'll have, well, I know we'll have time for that at the end. And then um, the third message, and you're, you're already doing this, you know, the work on your strategic planning, for example is reflective of, uh, of you folks thinking big, acting locally, and doing things now. Um, and, uh, and you know, we'll talk about how change, that the dramatic change that's required in this $60 billion, 13 half million patient system is not going to come solely from Bob Bell, you know, Deputy Minister Bob Bell's executive table. It's going to come from uh, actions of individuals and groups and enterprises like HSN, uh, and uh, and I really applaud you for the work that you're doing. And you know, if we again, if we can be of any help as this unfolds, uh, please, please call on us. So so why am I here? What, what is this OCHIS? What is the Office of the Chief Health Innovation Strategist? Uh, it was created about two and a half years ago to uh, execute the government's vision that it was time to leverage the state investment, a massive state investment, sixty billion dollars now, and growing in healthcare as an economic driver. So, so what does that mean? Um, it means that we've got a $60 billion business, and it is a business. In 2018, there's been more than enough written to establish that social enterprises, of which this is one, are businesses. Obviously, uh, you know, in the public sector, obviously not for profit, uh, but we now know uh, with data that the best outcomes come from the combination 
of the best thinking and operations of the public and private sector together, particularly in highly regulated industries. Um, so, uh, so we really need to um, ensure that we are looking at how we can invest optimally to leverage the, uh, the money spent on healthcare so that it's more than a cost center. Um, it, half the Fortune 50 companies are in um, health, and it's not just Pfizer and McKesson. It's, you know, if you, I'm sure you, you've seen this in the general media over the past two or three months. It is in a big, big way, Apple and Google and Microsoft and Amazon, for goodness sakes, they are going to transform healthcare. Um, but more importantly, they show that, uh, you know, when you've got a company like Ford looking at how to use the autonomous vehicle uh, in different ways, um, it shows how there are just many different angles that, uh, in, that get you to the health, investment in the health industry. Uh, but it is a significant business, a big job and wealth creator, arguably the biggest one in the 21st century. So why does that matter? Well, um, there's really, you know, we call it a health innovation imperative, and there are really two planks to this imperative. One is economic development, and the other looks at the health system sustainability. That economic development piece, I don't need to tell people in Sudbury how the world has changed. We are not able in Ontario to rely on lower cost industries, if you will, things like natural resource extraction, uh, manufacturing, in the same way that we have in the past. They will continue to be important parts of the economy, but they are not going to have the same dominant positions they did prior to, the, to uh, you know, previously. So that means that like the rest of the world, we're going to have to participate in the knowledge-based economy and we're going to have to compete to win because that is how competitive it is. And I know this because I sat on the other side of the table when I had the global responsibilities of Astra, at AstraZeneca and had teams of people from different jurisdictions, countries, provinces, states around the world, uh, you know, Team Egypt, Team California, Team uh, Australia, on and on it goes, innumerable visits literally uh, from China and uh, Southeast, Southeast Asian countries. So it's a highly competitive environment. So McKinsey or BCG will tell you, well, look, you got to pick a high growth sector in which you have a competitive advantage. And this is where the news gets much better for Ontario because we have a massive competitive advantage if we choose to look at it that way, namely a $60 billion uh, end user that makes up 70% of the healthcare spend in the province. And, um, and that is a tremendous advantage when we also know that we have, depending on who's counting, upwards of a thousand small and medium sized enterprises in Ontario, that are, many of which are already successful in, uh, in the health industry, in the health innovation industry. Um, you know, point click care uh, in north of Toronto has 1400 employees. They're a dominant position in providing network solutions in, uh, in Ontario, but they have uh, up to 15% now in the United States when it comes to long-term care facilities. Uh, Bayless Medical, north of Toronto, um, has you know, they, their biggest issues, they can't hire people quickly enough. In London, Ontario, Trudell Medical is a privately owned enterprise, still in London, Ontario, 400 employees and counting. They sell respiratory chambers and other things. Uh, the only reason they're in London is because of the, the loyalty of the family to the area. Uh, they haven't sold a dollar in Ontario. Bayless has only sold two, only sells two percent of its stuff um, in uh, in Canada, I believe, not even just Ontario. So there are lots of examples of these companies being really successful. Uh, we, but they're successful almost in spite of the fact that we have this end user, not because of it. So, um, so what about the rest of the world? What are they doing? Um, I'll steer clear for the moment of the U.S. because you know that seems to come produce a opposite results sometimes when you use the US as example. So let's look at Western Europe. Um, you know, global dominance by these big companies doesn't come by accident. Uh, in Denmark, they actually have global client leads for their big multinationals. The Deputy Consul General in New York City is the global client manager for Novo Nordisk. In the Netherlands, they have the ability to adopt and spread innovation developed by their domestic companies. Um, in Britain, when Bombardier doesn't win a, and this happened when I was there, when they didn't win a particular rail contract and their whole plant, 800 employees in the UK was at risk, guess what? They won the next one. Um, and on and on it goes. This is the way the rest of the world functions. 
but I think my best example now comes out of Boston, and we know how successful Boston is in patient outcomes, in research, in science, but also in health as a business. And I met with the head of the innovation hub at Brigham Women's Hospital, no doubt um, you will know of that institution, highly regarded. I do this type of presentation with him, and at the end of it he says, you know, I'm still kind of stuck on the fact that you're trying to convince or you're feeling you have to convince people that health is an economic driver. In my entire professional career, and I think this person was probably in the mid-30s, I have in Massachusetts, I've never heard anyone say anything other than health is an economic driver. So this is safe. This is uh, in the second half of the second decade of the 21st century. It's okay to see health as an industry. And what the advent of technology is showing is looking at it this way, growing our domestic companies, thinking about it from these types of perspectives is best for patient outcomes. This is how we will get optimal impact for our investment in health, particularly health innovation, and how we will improve patient outcomes. Which brings me to the second plank of the imperative, and that's the health system sustainability one. So I've become a bit you know, bolder as my two and a half years have advanced. Uh, initially, you know, I, I, I've learned, so I guess my point is I've learned more about this in this role. So what's this? What's this is at the beginning I was saying, um, and this is the deputy's direction, you know, know that the, if we don't get better at adopting and spreading innovation within our system, our system won't be sustainable any longer. So that was interesting. He's obviously a very smart guy. Uh, I heard that mantra a lot. Here's what I learned somewhere early in the piece. The system is not sustainable as it's currently constructed given the demographic pressures ahead of us. And I don't, I don't need to, I don't want to be pedantic. I don't need to explain that to you, but it's not sustainable. You know, care ma enhanced care management is only going to get us so far. We can't continue to plow money into a health system uh, without it ensuring that the money is efficiently spent. But here's the other thing we can't do. We can't, and this brings me to your strategic planning exercise. Um, I love this job and, and uh, you know, I just continue to believe it's important in making a difference. There are a couple of the days where it's where sometimes I'm not so sure, and one of them was I think the third deck in a row, a strategy deck, uh, hit the table at the uh, you know Bob's executive leadership team, and it it didn't. I'm not even going to tell you what the strategies were because it's been addressed subsequently, but none of them addressed health innovation or technology. They you know pick a metaphor, but basically they had two pillars: staffing and beds. So people and capital investment. That's not gonna get it done. And oh, by the way, there isn't an enterprise in the rest of the world, not-for-profit, charity, or for-profit, that thinks in those terms in the second half of the second decade of the 21st century. So this brings me to the strategic plan. Uh, you know, I, I, anything I can do to help you think about how, as every other enterprise does, that the investment innovation, new innovative health technologies and processes is critical to actually having a sustainable healthcare system, uh, I, am, I am very happy to help you with. Um, and there are examples of other institutions that do this really well, and we can talk about them as the present discussion unfolds, presentation unfolds. You know, Southlake uh, Regional, it, under the leadership of Dr. David Williams and, uh, and his innovation team, have been right out front on using modern procurement techniques like value-based procurement, competitive dialogue, and getting optimal value for their investment while improving patient outcomes, while building a, a data base from which they can measure improvement in an organized and reliable way. So there are examples of institutions that have done this, but generally, wherever we are in the system, we need to get to a place where you don't have a chief health innovation strategist. You don't have a digital health secretary. What you have are leaders and uh, operational people that are fluent in the ability to bring health innovation, new innovative health technologies and processes into their day-to-day -day operations. Uh, because that is the way to improve patient outcomes and optimize the impact of investment. If we just keep plowing money uh, into systems, you know, putting our whole fingers in the holes in the dike, you know, we're not gonna get it done. And, and I, I'm quite, bold as you can say, like this is where I'm not speaking for the ministry, right? This is where I get to be a little bit different. But my colleague who has roughly this job in Alberta, Justin Reimer, and you, some of you may know him, we did a joint presentation to the task force, to a federal task force on this issue, uh, I guess last month, a couple months ago maybe. And I did this version, and at the end, here's what he says. 
you know, I certainly agree with what Bill has just said. I go further than that. I think the whole public system is at risk if we don't figure this out because we're this close, this close to walking into a health system like HSN with more personal health information on our wrists, certainly in our phone, than they have at the institution. It's readily available, it's reliable, it's there. And by the way, there's going to be increase, increasingly going to be access to diagnostic and treatment information online that people will just vote with. If we don't figure this out, people will just vote with their feet. And I'm not saying that's, you know, clinicians in the room, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's optimal. I'm not saying that's what patients should do, but that's what patients will do. And to be really, and, and so his point is the whole public system's at risk. Like people will vote for their feet. And I kind of run it out by saying, you know, Clayton Christensen out of Harvard Business School wrote about disruptive innovation. He looked at health. And, and here's what, one of the things you can take from it. Uh, super smart people who really knew their industry were completely blindsided by disruptive innovators from outside. So pick one. Um, you know, it, and, and you can think about uh, things that are very recently in the news, like uh, Uber, Airbnb, these types of innovations that have blasted holes in industries. The common theme amongst those people is they didn't see it coming, they underestimated it, and they didn't know how to react, and certainly didn't react quickly enough. I'm not sure that it was even possible, but they didn't. I don't know why we think as health leaders that we're somehow smarter or better or more adept or have higher business acuity or experiential learning or whatever it might be to withstand that. Like what makes us different? So we uh, you know, look at what Apple announced yesterday, well, I guess now two days ago, they're spread across 40 health systems in the US with their effectively EHR model and they just got going. You saw the Berkshire Hathaway Amazon combination. We don't really even know what they're up to but these are the world's largest and most, uh, you know, hot, best capitalized companies, and they're coming after healthcare. So, if you don't buy me on the economic development side, which I hope you do, uh, hopefully you'll hang with me when we're talking about um, ensuring a sustainable health system. Uh, so the bottom line is we really have to get better at at having a, an improved health innovation receptor capacity, so we can adopt and spread innovation in our systems. Um, and I I think HSN. Frankly, the fact that you had me here now talking twice in 24 hours uh, is really alive to this, and I applaud you for that. Um, the purpose we, of our office uh, is to drive collaboration across the system to accelerate the adoption and diffusion of new innovative health technologies. And there's three objectives for this. Improve patient outcomes. So in accordance with the patient first strategy, it always has to be about patient outcomes. Um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, secondly, optimize the impact. So the impact not the amount of money or you know, some other measurement, the impact of our investment in health innovation. So this, this brings in evidence as to cost effectiveness, health technology assessment, health technology management, these kinds of things. And lastly, scaling health innovation companies, particularly those in Ontario. Now I have to, I'm very quick at this point to say, you know, this is not at the exclusion or an us versus them thing with respect to global multinationals, not at all. Um, uh, this is not 1975. We're not picking domestic companies and jamming them into the system regardless of whether they should be uh, or not. Instead, we're a catalyst to grow a health innovation ecosystem. We want to grow the health innovation receptor capacity, grow that pie, if you will, because our bet is our Ontario small and medium-sized enterprises, that some of the, you know, including those ones I mentioned earlier, they're going to win their share just like they have around the world. And we really welcome the work with companies that I know you work with. For example, you know, whether it's uh, Medtronic or Baxter or GE Healthcare, these have big footprints in Ontario and we want to grow them um, as well. From the very beginning, we've said that we're going to be judged on the impact we have, not on the number, you know, the activity we generate, speeches we give, meetings we hold. So we've really ruthlessly prioritized. We don't focus on biopharmaceuticals. We don't focus on commercial labs. You won't hear me talk about some of the big, big issues. So for our companies, financing, uh, privacy, uh, the talent, uh, you know, the, the talent issue. Uh, these are really important issues, but we don't focus on them. Instead, we have two overarching priorities. Uh, one is uh, optimizing the pathways. So we have a demand pull for innovation into the system. I'm not here to advocate for private sector delivery. It's, it's not my job, and, and so it's irrelevant what I think. But one of the nice things about that system is you are forced to uh, innovate because you need to improve your customer offering or your patient offering at the same or lower cost if you're going to survive. If you don't, you won't survive. It's that simple. We want to find a way to replicate that competitive notion insofar as it has us better at pulling in new ideas, new processes, new technologies 
to, uh, to, as I said, improve patient outcomes really at the same or lower cost. We can talk about lots of barriers on this. Risk aversion is huge. A capability gap is really, you know, the risk aversion is symptomatic of a capability gap. We need stronger business acuity up and down and around the system. I'm not saying only business people, but it needs to be people who understand how to prudently manage risk as opposed to listen to procurement officials and, and in-house legal who want to grind risk to zero. I'm not demonizing them. I used to be one. But look, it's an easy, no is an easy answer. When I was at Tories, those of you know the firm, we didn't get paid exorbitant fees to say no. We got paid exorbitant fees to find the path through to yes. So, so we need to get there. Um, and the other thing we really need to find our way through on is clinician leadership. So the highest performing uh, health service organizations in the world are characterized by a strategic supply chain management, which gets us to the procurement piece, the second overarching priority, and clinician leadership. Uh, as well as those high business capabilities and rounding out the uh, the experience experiential so clinician leadership is really key we spend a lot of time with clinicians the biggest champions of what we do are clinicians uh, i suspect there are many of you in the room which is why you're here so so these are the things that we need to do to, to create that pathway to the adoption and scalability of innovation that's a point on a spectrum further along the, the spectrum is procurement procurement, buying stuff. We're shifting from a cost-based system to a value-based procurement model. Um, this has been the year, subject of an EU directive now for about four years. So in other words, it's mandatory in the European Union. High-performing organizations in the US like Kaiser, like Cleveland Clinic, like Mayo, like others, you know, they look at value. They don't you know, they're not grinding costs down. Now, I understand the system is such that uh, these are the types of incent the incentives that are in place lead people to this type of decision making, uh, you know, focusing more on cost in the short term. But we really want to crack that nut. And then the three areas that we're digging in on are home and community care, digital health, and enhancing um, uh, health outcomes for Indigenous people. But above all else, I'll come back to patients, you know, in alignment with patients first. We really, it just as you all do in the room, uh, you know, patience is why we do this. And um, this, this is, uh, you know, you're going to hear me talk about our value-based innovation framework and support of value-based care. Um, but it is all about the patients. And, and I just keep telling the story that I love. I'm enthusiastic now. Think of what I was like three months ago. Uh, sorry, three months into my job. And I was like, having a drink with a friend and <laughs> no doubt carrying on about how much I love my job and the opportunity and how great the people are and all this stuff. And she said, that's great, I love, you know, this is terrific, you love your job, that's awesome. So from a patient perspective, like what am I gonna see that's different in a couple of years because of the work you're doing? And my shoulders slumped, <laughs> like, darn it. That's a very good question. So my team actually hearing this story put this up on the wall above our printer, it's still there. It is, it is literally as the case with everyone in the room, why we do what we do. <clears throat> so what are we doing? We're bringing a value-based innovation framework to the province of Ontario. A new way of doing business, if you will, in health and innovation. So it's in support of value-based care and creating jobs in the province. And we've talked about the three objectives. When you talk, think about how we do it, and again, uh, a lot of this, I think, drives back to your strategic plan. We look at empowering demand drivers, empowering the innovators, and in the middle, generating evidence and facilitating the evaluation of the evidence. What we're talking about has to be evidence-based. I, I will continue to kind of... <laughs> notion that we have to be a slave to evidence and there's some important differences between this and the pharma industry with which I was much more familiar when I took the job um, and this being the non-pharma health tech industry they're different industries but at the end of the day we need to be evidence-based and I suspect that everyone in that room would agree with me what do I mean by empowering demand drivers well let's look at the strategic plan that you're talking about um, we've had different experiences where we even with the most sophisticated hospitals high capabilities where they really could learn a lot more about this notion of creating the innovation. And they want to, by the way, it's pretty exciting. So, so what does that mean? Well, value-based procurement is a pretty good start. So we have shared service organizations, yes, but of course they take their orders, uh, if you will, from the, the individual institutions like your own. So, so we want the, the hospitals or the LIN, the hospitals and the LINs and the primary care networks and long-term care facilities to be more adept at things like value-based procurement. Uh, also, understand how important it is to set the priority. So something else I would suggest that, that you do in your strategic plan, articulate what the priorities are. Now, you don't, I don't mean overprescribe. Uh, the government, for example, still has a tendency 
even when talking about innovation, to want to overprescribe. So they say we want it, we want innovation in a particular area, but then they write out <laughs> we we want it to do this in this way in this time frame. It kind of defeats the purpose. So so we want our uh, demand drivers to really understand more how important it is to get your priorities. We want them to be better at value-based procurement. We want them to be better at understanding the cost of providing services. Value-based care equals, you know, under that Porter Kaplan definition, patient outcomes. So patient outcomes, not process outcomes, over the actual cost of delivering that care. Not the reimbursable cost or the chargeable cost, but the actual cost. It would be great, again, if in the strategic plan we, uh, you know, you framed it in that notion of value-based care, as because that that opportunity exists for you to leapfrog at some of the other hospitals. Empowering innovators is kind of obvious. You know, have them more adept at understanding the importance of ROI, understanding how important it is to actually ask answer a priority of the system, not just have a bright shiny bauble. Um, and so we help them a lot on that front. And on the evidence piece, anything we can do to to, to get away from the notion that we need some version of, you know, an RCT or a big complex trial or examination. When we're talking about non-biopharmaceutical health tech that, for example, isn't invasive, isn't expensive, um, uh, you know, but has a product life cycle of 18 months or two years, we just need to get better at that. And, and so we've got lots of examples on how that works. Um, we've come a long way in different uh, in different areas. So, so I'm going to tell you about some of them and try to ground it back to your strategic plan. Uh, Just, we have mm, five minutes. Okay. Um, on our innovation brokers, uh, we have, well, we've hired innovation brokers. So these are field-based people who, uh, in, and they are, uh, you know, a guy who, used, who started Sunbrook International, Jennifer Zelmer, who uh, is very well known in the industry, and Keho. So Keho. Uh, is an example of how we've got hospitals that are already setting out their priorities. So they're doing this because they've struck an innovation task force as our innovation broker. And what's worked for them? Well, what's worked for them is they've started out by asking themselves the fundamental question. So under the leadership of Andy Smith and Michael Apcon, they've said, well, why, <coughs> how come we're not better at adopting and scaling innovation? So that's a very fundamental question to answer. Then they put together a group to actually examine that question. Now they've started to take, uh, to execute tactics to get there. They have their 14 problem statements uh, that are their priorities. They are bringing companies in to do the validation work. I think there's about 35 companies that have applied and four maybe that have been accepted to get validation done in these leading uh, hospital institute, uh, hospitals. And, um, and we're going to, oh, and, and myth busting when it comes to procurement. So this is a, a big thing, right? You hear so many people saying you can't do this, that, or the other thing because of the broader public sector procurement directive and guidelines. Well, that's not true. Uh, I'd rewrite them because I'm a lawyer and I can't help it and they're poorly written. Well, you can do all the things we're talking about. So Keho, um, again, as you think about how your work unfolds, focusing on, on things that are tactical um, under that guise of driving through um, a model that pulls innovation into the system in support of value-based care would be one of the suggestions I'd leave with you and something that's really worked. So, um, so KO would be a good resource and we're gonna, for what it's worth, bring along the OHA um, in 2018. Um, Mars Excite is an example of how you can uh, participate by providing uh, you know, working with companies to provide evidence, uh, sort of early in, input into evidence, into what evidence would be required to actually get adopted by the healthcare system. So Excite has a bit of a checkered past. It's taken a long time to get to the point where we've got three um, products that have come through. But what we do have now is real experience where the ministry working with an outside agency like Excite and industry and HQO slash OTAC has a much higher comfort level in actually engaging with industry. So something else to think about as you focus on innovation. I came from pharma, quote, big bad pharma. So I understand how there's a reticence to engage with quote unquote industry in air quotes. But that's not the case when it comes to non-biopharma health tech. Look, you, you have companies, no doubt, like, like people in that room have probably started companies. We heard from somebody last night, for example. That's not big bad industry. Um, these often are a couple of uh, researchers or a couple of clinicians and a laptop with a good idea. 
but more to the point, if you don't find a way to engage with them in a safe way, this is more complicated and diverse than putting pills in people's tummies or maybe you know, subcutaneously injecting them. Um, they are many different devices and technologies and software and all sorts of different things. You need to understand how they work and what their potential is to even understand whether or not they should be considered and whether or not they should be pulled into the system. So finding that safe place to have those conversations is something that Excite will do going forward. We're effectively have spun it out now. We're not going to be funding it anymore. We don't have to after this year. And it's a real example of something that's, that's worked uh, really well. I want to spend uh, a couple minutes uh, on this value-based innovation program. So remember we talked about a value-based innovation framework. This has become the signature program. And this is really exciting. And it's not my view. It's what people are telling us. What is it? It is a program, unfortunately named program, that uses modern procurement techniques, a demand-driven approach to hospitals, LINs, the pharma care networks, whatever it might be, are identifying their priorities, using outcomes-based or value-based procurement, openly calling for industry solutions. Um, we are working in tandem with the people that run the hospital formulas so we can help break you know, through those funding barriers that hit when, you, know, you get when you hit the walls of silos. Um, but ultimately, it's about risk sharing and gain sharing, and we can pay to establish a cost baseline because we want to get to the point where we're building a muscle memory in the whole system to adopt and scale health innovation. And we've got two projects in already. One, led by Ottawa Heart, is looking at uh, reducing the infection rate for um, implantable devices. Now, we're, we're, we're just at gathering our evidence now. If, if, for example, our infection rate is lower than it is in the United States, we may not pursue that one. But that we are really focused on generating the evidence to figure out whether it's something we should be working on at all. Again, instead of just kind of you know, believing and working with uh, people who are throwing ideas over the transom. So watch for that news. But the one I think that's particularly exciting uh, for clinicians is for the first time, we've got the 12 trauma centers in Ontario doing a pan-Ontario procurement of ICDs. So, um, you know, again, led by clinicians, working with procurement experts, uh, particularly Plexus in this case, and one guy, Doug Klein in particular, who really knows value-based procurement. Um, but, but looking at how we could get away from cost, from price being the only determiner of the devices that are provided. We're, don't worry, we're not gonna you know, pick one to cover the whole province or anything like that. It's really about building that muscle where we have the trauma centers working together and articulating for themselves what the other components are of value so that they can engage in, in, in more ho uh, holistic conversations uh, with business purpose and looking for optimal patient outcomes while preserving flexibility for clinicians. So that's really, really great stuff. I'll tell you the next two priorities, we've got two streams going forward. One is yeah, going to be, wrap it up okay, one of them is going to be uh, looking at reduce, reduction of harmful falls in long-term care facilities. And then there'll be an open call for different aspects of the system that, um, uh, you know, like calling for asking Lynn's what their priorities are. So as you think about things that you want to do in your strategic plan, um, we can talk more about how that can play into the value-based uh, innovation program as it unfolds. So the last part, just so you know, um, the Health Technologies Fund is an opportunity for health service providers like those to identify their priorities, partner up with companies that are providing solutions, and, uh, and get a bit of money from us uh, we've just announced our third call. It's been unbelievably successful. We're seeing real results as we, as we go across the country, and we can talk a little bit more about um, what those look like and the great media coverage they're getting. And then uh, we've got a future ahead of us in digital health where you're going to see e-prescribing, e-consult, uh, e-referral uh, rolling out across Ontario, not all in one year or anything like that, but we're finally at a place where we have a focused efforts coming out of the ministry, but in conjunction with health service providers. So again, as you think about your strategic plan, you can think about the different ways that uh, HSN can participate, but know that we're focusing on an open API policy, encouraging data standardization, interoperability through the use of fire, and even through HIS renewal, ensuring that our systems are more open to different solution providers. So I'm gonna stop there. Remember, health is an economic driver, and, uh, and I really want to congratulate you all for your work today. Thanks a lot.
Okay, thank you, uh, Bill. I, I'm up at the mic. I just want to make sure you can hear me. That's pretty quiet. I'm not sure I can hear that. Can you turn the volume up? Is this better? Oh, that's better. Yeah, okay, great. So um, just want you to know there's about, um, I'm going to say, 80, 90 people in the room here that have been listening intently. And this is their opportunity to um, ask questions. To do so, we have a mic set up in the middle of the room, and we did the sound check earlier. It's going to work best if you do have a question to please stand up and pose it at the mic. Or if you have a question that you're uh, a little shy or nervous about asking publicly, if you want to write it down, um, Emily will um, grab those pieces of paper from you that were on your chairs and, um, and uh, do that on your behalf. So I'm going to start uh, as an icebreaker in terms of asking a question. Um, it was actually from a colleague who couldn't be here tonight but wanted, uh, I'd sort of uh, teased her a little bit with your slide deck, didn't show it to her, but said, hey, there's maybe some stuff in here that might interest you. Um, can you just please um, expand a little bit more fully on the work that you're doing as it relates to innovation in Indigenous health. Uh, I'd, we'd like to hear more about that given some of the work that's going on in our own research institute here in Sudbury. So can you uh, elaborate more fully on uh, what is currently happening and what uh, is in the future with OCHIS? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I. I Figured somebody would want to know more about it. I probably should include it in the presentation. Um, so, so let, let me tell you what my aspiration was at the very beginning, um, and and it went something like, you know, if we went to a whiteboard that might be behind you somewhere and drew up a health delivery system relating to um, delivery of health to indigenous folks, perhaps on reserves, uh, knowing what we know and having being able to avail ourselves of modern technology, it would look nothing like what's happening, particularly on reserves, particularly in remote locations. Um, and it's a real opportunity to leapfrog, I think, um, the from the patient's outcomes perspective. I mean, think of mobile phone uh, penetration into Africa. They had no coverage because it was so expensive to you know run wires and then lay cable and all that kind of stuff. But then they weren't burdened by that infrastructure, so mobile phones came along and you know, the capital one, if you can afford a mobile phone, the variable cost is almost nothing because they're not trying to recover costs from, uh, from overhead. Uh, that is the aspirational goal for me in health uh, when it comes to reserves in particular. Um, and it's not just a real rural issue. You know, Six Nations like, is the largest and most populous uh, reserve, and that's you know, between Hamilton and Brantford and Toronto. So, um, so that was the aspirational goal. Um, I, I grew up in southern Alberta. The Blood and Pig End Reserves were around Lethbridge. So, uh, and I did some work on the reserves and, and worked with Indigenous colleagues uh, at different stops along the way. So I have some familiarity with, uh, with the cultural differences. Um, of course, don't profess to know everything, but, but at least have a, uh, you know, some familiarity with it. So, I knew right away that consultation was going to, be, going to be really important. I still believe that's critical. And in fact, we we're just about to embark on uh, proper discussions with Indigenous leaders um, across Ontario about what our new Indigenous health broker, innovation broker, should do. Uh, what should the capabilities be? What should the priorities be? And, then, and, and, and so even before we get to hiring that person, uh, and that person gets to you know start to execute the work. We are now engaging in conversations about what they should do and what the capability should be. So so that's the first thing. Um, secondly, we've had conversations with, for example, Laurie Davis Hill at Six Nations, um, where where we wanted to understand better just even the art of the possible, and uh, and learned a lot. For example, um, you know when I say a lot, I mean we know about the prevalence of cardiovascular for example. But I mean, we learned a lot about what it really meant on the ground. And so that, that's had a chance to, to inform our thinking. Here's what I wasn't expecting. To be brutally honest, what I wasn't expecting was how long and how arduous the process would be to just kind of get out of our government. You know, get this idea out of our government. Um, you, you know, we had a lot of discussions within, with the ministry, various ministries involved, 
and it, it was just taking a long time. And so we have not had an opportunity to retrench. Uh, we decided to hire the innovation, to pursue an innovation broker, and that's gonna be the path we're going down. But one of the things I'd love, so if I were there, one of the things I would be looking for are people, knowing, knowing what you do, and it's the premise for the question, uh, you know, looking for people that have some interest in talking to us about it. I don't mean like applying for the job necessarily, and I don't even be part of the more formal consultation exercise, but people who uh, have an acuity in the area, have some ideas, and maybe the person posed a question, for example, had some experience of what's worked and what's not worked. That's the conversation we're, uh, we're embarking. So it is not as advanced as I had hoped it would be, or frankly, as the other uh, initiatives are, but it is important and we are going to continue to work on it. Great, thank you. So early days. Yeah. Um, questions from the uh, from the audience. Come on up. Hi, Rose. Um, my name is Rose Pinawanaquit, Aboriginal coordinator here at the hospital. Oh, I really can't hear that. Can you, my name is Rose Pinawanaquit. I'm here. Um, I'm the Aboriginal coordinator for the hospital for the NECC. So um, I'm kind of wondering who sits at the table for Indigenous people at your table like to represent for us? Like, so we just said the last part again, sorry? Who sits at the table, who represents for indigenous people? So that's what we don't know right now, right? We, we have um, talked to the Ministry of, uh, of Industry, uh, Relations Ministry and we want to get their advice on who to speak with. So we're, we're in those early days, right? So again, if, if you have suggestions, um, or you'd like to participate, I mean, you know, please send me an email and we're happy to have those conversations. It's early days for that. Okay, so another question is that um, when I'm thinking about uh, this innovation and I'm thinking about digital, uh, the digital technology that's coming forth for our rural First Nation communities, and when we think about that, um, some of the challenges that I think of for our communities are weather increments and being able to monitor some of the um, technology and the, um, I guess, the uh, when they're in the communities and how they're able to be able to get that virtual care within their community be, communities. Because what I've heard from some of our First Nation Cree people is that they've um, they don't they can't work that OTN at some point in time just because. Um, it goes down from time to time. There's challenges with it and other different things too as well. So I'm thinking when, when we look at this innovation and when we look at digital health, I, when we look at um, using phones and emails and things, it, I think that would be a best, one of the best outcomes. Of these, uh, and, I was, and I had listened to your, um, to your presentation on uh, YouTube this afternoon, so which brought forth a couple of other things too that I'd like to sit down and visit with you with regards to that. And you talked about um, you talked about land extraction, land resource extraction. So I'm thinking you'd have to have free prior informed consent with our First Nation people too as well. So you'll have to have the PTOs involved when I'm when I'm looking at that too as well in terms of being able to um, have those services or access those services within our communities too as well. But those are some of the issues that I had thought that uh, should come forth. Yeah, it sounds like we should have a longer conversation. Uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Again, I'm storing it out there in person, but but perhaps you could you cut my email address up there on the screen. Um, happy to like send an email, and then we can have a proper conversation about it. Um, the uh, you know we I went to Sioux Lookout, uh, and it was a real eye opener. Not you know for many reasons, um, all so positive generally. Um, and then I went to Thunder Bay Regional, which of course is the acute care facility in Thunder Bay, and. We learned a lot there about how I'm making grandiose statements about leapfrogging and you know going on about that, and yet the size of the pipe to some of those reserves just north of Stu Lookout is so small that he said they said we weren't, we weren't exaggerating. You know, if four people on the reserve are watching Netflix, that uses up the capacity. So. It's one of the things we took back here, and we're, we're engaging uh, federal colleagues with on, like that's table stakes. You know, we're not we're not going to be able to talk about 
uh, the kinds of technologies that could make it, uh, that could lead to better patient outcomes at a much more cost, uh, lower cost point. Um, if we can't get some of these infrastructure points correct, and I know I'm not the first person to say that, and I know there's lots of other issues that you could argue are, are more, well, probably are more important, like safe drinking water, et cetera, access to physicians, these kinds of things. But they matter, and um, and I would really like to find our way through, uh, with help from the right colleagues, like sounds like maybe yourself, to see how we can do a better job on that. And and I think we've got lots of allies, uh, you know, including Canada Health Info has a lot of money federally and is, has their eye open to uh, scalability across the country, including reserves. And they're an ally in, in trying to uh, accelerate the adoption of uh, innovation onto the reserves in particular. Can I just add, Bill, one thing to your comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Yeah, so um, just to build on what he said, um, one thing to keep in mind, and this, this may speak to HSN and your strategic planning process, um, one of the takeaways we had when we visited, um, you know, visit further north of Ontario was, you know, people have talked a lot about where innovation flows from, and there's lots of technology partners and hospitals in Toronto that are getting excited about greater, greater remote monitoring capabilities. So. Patients that get surgery and this get sent home, you know, half an hour or an hour from the hospital in downtown Toronto. And the you know, the staff and so looked out of the staff in Thunder Bay would stare and say, you know, our, our entire model of delivery is remote. Everything we do to serve the across the land and others is is remote. So if anything, I think or we think there's a huge opportunity for you know reverse innovation or learning from the North to go down to Toronto or to other parts of the province because so much of the work you do, you know, serving your local community and across the region and HSN being the, the leader that it is, um, that's one area where I think you've already shown leadership and will continue to show leadership around care integration, you know, um, remote delivery of care, virtual medicine, um, tele telehome care. Um, you know, we know a little bit about it, but there's so much more happening, I think, um, could potentially be another pillar of strength for the work and services that you offer. Thanks, John. Uh, there's another question here. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, Bill. My name is Nicole Everest. Thank you for a compelling presentation. I found this very, very interesting. Um, part of my question was answered by the previous speaker. Um, you talked earlier about finding solutions to complex health challenges that we have, and obviously some of our local, and that's what you're advocating for. Same time, you're working with various groups to define uh, priorities. You know, first of all, you know that you don't have to come in from wherever you are into the hospital. Um, secondly, you will just be able to have a higher level of comfort overall because you know that those resources are available to you. And we all know those intangibles can be powerful in and of themselves. Um, but then that also creates a platform for starting to measure on a population health basis. Um, things that are working and things that aren't working, and also creates the opportunity for things like artificial intelligence, which is not too far in the future, really, practically. Uh, you know, we know companies that already are using AI for cognitive behavioral therapy um, because it, it works for that 80% of the population that doesn't need one on one. And then it frees up uh, human labor, like the expensive kind of labor, to engage one on one with the 20% that really do. So, kind of anything that's in home community care and long term care, um, it's, you know, related to that are senior strategies and tackling dementia, um, diabetes, right? Again, uh, particularly certain subgroups of the population, anything that can um, prevent people from becoming diabetic and allow them to better manage themselves if they are diabetic will be immensely helpful. Because I think as everyone in the room knows, what you're trying to do is, is yes, identify the 5% uh, of, of people, those complex patients that use up a big chunk of the health resources. But you're also trying, as someone put it to me the other day, what might even be more important is identifying the next 20% and getting at them and working with them to ensure they don't become part of the 5%. So, any, and diabetes is a great example, as are other chronic illnesses like COPD and, uh, and cardiovascular, other cardiovascular diseases. But 
you know, like CHF. So, so if you can kind of rank them as home community care slash long-term care, and then identifying the complex patients and helping them manage. Uh, so diabetes sits at the top of the list, CHF uh, and COPD are the other examples. Those, those are probably the highest priorities generally for the system and the ones I think that have the greatest potential. But, um, you know, here's another one that I'd really like us to talk about in 2018, um, especially when I focus on outcomes. So one of the things I'd like to get people to start talking about is what if we just set an outcome to reduce hospital admissions? I'm not talking about wait times, not that old chest out of reduced wait times. That, that to me, and that, well, data showed it over and over again, that's, that's one aspect of a problem. The bigger challenge is how do we just reduce admissions <clears throat> and or reduce readmissions? And what kind of a system would we have if we actually have that as the outcome and started to build it from that? I think those are probably uh, the biggest general priorities we have. John, I don't know if you have any comments from the health service side. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, not a lot to add. I mean, I'd say, I didn't really get a question. It's not like you asked what our priorities are or where do, do our priorities fit. Um, I'd say a lot of our work also, we sort of work at a at a meta level because it's, 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 there's no shortage of priorities in healthcare. There's no shortage of documents that speak about priorities over there. Ministry documents, the LIN strat plans, HSN or you know, HSP zone strat plans. So, one thing we've tried to do with some of the programs Bill spoke to earlier with value-based innovation or HTF or others is um, how do we sort of build capacity in the system to identify, to allow people with those priorities, with challenges to find solutions to them um, and use innovation as a, as a lever tool to get there. And then um, secondly, another sort of big focus of ours has been how do we kind of reduce some of the barriers to scale and spread? So, you know, we've got lots of pilots, we've got lots of innovations, there's so much happening in every land and every hospital that works. Um, we don't always need to reinvent the wheel if someone knows, you know, as Bill said, chronic disease management or, um, you know, cardiac care or anything else. None of these are really new issues. So, how do we um, get through some of the silos and bureaucracy in our system to get those into the system faster or to take something that's working in Sudbury and spread it wider. So um, we try to think a lot about that or as part of our communications and, and spread, um, point to examples or, or share learnings and um, see if we can speed that adoption path a little bit more. Thanks, there's another question, Amadeo. Hi, uh, both a question and a comment. Um, First, first a comment, I think one of the things that might be very useful is for you to feedback with uh, different groups uh, and, and companies who, uh, including my, myself, that are they're trying to uh, get a health uh, innovation. We have a, a company that's created a diagnostic. And uh, what has worked for us and what hasn't worked for us. So uh, the company that I was involved in, RNA Diagnostics, I'm still involved in, uh, we'd work with the Mars Excite program. What worked for us, what didn't work for us. Um, I think you could get a lot of uh, useful feedback um, that I think would help uh, hone, the, uh, hone the programs. My question is, for example, related to the Health Technologies Fund. I was really excited about the fund, and then you find out that there's a theme. And that theme has actually persisted over the three competitions. Well, that's great if you have a health technology that is consistent with that theme. But to me, the whole idea of having a health technology is fun. But then someone creates a theme, then all of a sudden you're restricting what potentially could be major health innovations because it doesn't mesh with the theme of that time. And maybe then you move on to another theme away from, say, closer to home, and then someone has a closer to home strategy, but you moved on to another theme. Why have a theme? Why not have a, a health technologies fund that could potentially look at any innovation, regardless of whether it matches a theme or not? Yeah, so those are good points. Um, on the first one, I mean, look, by all means, uh, I'd love to hear about your experiences. I'll be honest with you, we've had um, 
I'm not sure I'm exaggerating if I were to say hundreds of those conversations <coughs> with small and medium-sized companies in Ontario. I mean, that's literally the, uh, the questions that we ask companies, and we've met hundreds of them. Um, you know, what, what are your barriers? What has worked and what hasn't worked? Um, and so, uh, please, by all means, send us an email, <coughs> and we can, we can learn from you as well. That's definitely what we're doing. Because there, uh, have, there have been very positive well. things and negative things, both. What's that? Sorry? There have been both positive and negative experiences with various, um, uh, for example, Ontario Centers of Excellence. We have very good positive experience with them. Uh, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. So I'm uh, happy to hear about your particular ones. Uh, again, if we were in person, it would be a bit easier. Uh, but if you send us uh, an email, we can arrange that conversation. We're always, always listening. Um, on the Health Technologies Fund, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't disagree with your premise. Um, it gets practical very quickly, and as I've said, you know, the list of opportunities, you know, I'm the glass half full. Every challenge is an opportunity, so I use the word opportunity. Um, in Ontario's health system is as long as we're tall. So. Um, we, I, it just was my call up front that instead of just spreading that peanut butter so thin that we aren't able to crystallize the thinking in one or two particular areas with that fund, um, we're going to actually dig in on the highest priority areas. And so, you know, it's just, I don't know if it's right or wrong, um, it's been immensely uh, well received and really successful in generating not just ideas, but because there, and this leads to the second reason, it's a very practical one, because there's a similarity of purpose, it just allowed the expert panel to review with some consistency and integrity the relative merits of the submissions, because it's never apples to apples, but at least it's closer. Um, and then as we've now gone through, uh, you know, starting to generate the evidence, it's, it's not directly comparable because not everybody is tackling the same problem, but we're in the same ballpark. So the conversation, when it gets time to actually deciding how we can pull things in the system, which is what this, the goal is, it's not, to, these aren't just pilots that are gonna be left to die, which is kind of what's been happening in Ontario. We want them in the system. The, the narrower we kept it, the more likely we were that we would get real attention from people, real evidence that's generated, and, and it's more easily comparable across the system. It's, I've been very careful to say, look, our priority ranking in no way is a relative importance uh, <coughs> uh, ranking. It is a practical one. Um, we can't be all things to all people. I, I won't do that because if I did, we just won't have impact in any particular area. So to play out the alternative, <clears throat> you know, we have about 15, give or take 15 awards each round. If it were to be open-ended, we would have one here, one you know doing this, another doing that, and it's it becomes almost completely hit or miss when you're looking at the overall approach for a particular priority area. Now, having said all that, on the value-based innovation program, which is that you know the one where we're building the muscle memory, the one that's actually a bigger program. Um, our two projects so far, one, Pan-Ontario Procurement of ICDs, which isn't as value-based procurement as, we're, as we'd like, it kind of came from a different direction, we, had, we adopted it, if you will, and uh, looking at reducing infection rates on, on implantable devices. Um, but the third and fourth will be the beginning of, of uh, our, our usual streams, or what will become usual streams. On the one hand, we will have um, priorities identified by the system. So long-term care. None of the two biggest priorities by a distance is I'm told the long-term care, medication management, reducing harmful falls. The cost to the system of a harmful fall in a long-term care is home is significant and, and our performance is way below best practice globally. So that, I can't announce anything because we're kind of in this period, pre-election period, but, but maybe, you know, down this stream of priorities identified by the health system, the first one will be reduction of harmful faults. But the second stream will be what you've described. It's going to be an open call. We're going to say to LINs, because this stuff has to be driven by LINs if we're actually going to get it adopted. Um, 
we're going to say, you know, world is your oyster, the health world is your oyster. Pick, pick a priority area, um, knowing that you're going to have to find an industry solution. So, you know, most people have some prospective partners in any way in mind before they embark. But nevertheless, it will be open, as you suggest, because, uh, you know, what we don't want to do is focus only on one area. Um, but I'm very, very cognizant, and all my experience over time has told me if everything's a priority, nothing is. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> Yeah, we have heard that before. Um, we have about five minutes left in terms of questions, so I just want to do a process check. Did anybody have a question that they wrote on a card and want uh, us to, f to field that? Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, we've got one here, just a moment. Sorry for anybody that uh, has had interaction with me in the past that I keep beating this drum of patient engagement. But my question uh, does come down to um, a lot of what you've been saying is the system providing and creating that draw of innovation to provide for people. Um, I'm wondering if there's any, or do you, is there any value in engaging our community and having our community be that draw for innovation? Um, like, do you think we can make a difference? Do you think if, in engaging our community and our public and our patients and families, uh, can we be uh, a force to bring that innovation? Oh boy, I'm not sure I got uh, enough of that question to be able to answer. I'll, Could you just, I'll, just, it? I'll repeat it. I guess the question was about engagement, and um, Paulette is one of our patient and family advisors here, and so, uh, constantly beats the drum of uh, just ask us and we'll tell you. So I guess the question generally was about um, an approach that might be helpful could be coming to community, asking about what the particular challenge is and then engaging in conversations about solution to draw innovation and innovative ideas out. Did that paraphrase you? Okay. So uh, to what extent are you dealing directly with, um, you, you had talked earlier about the drivers uh, being the health service providers, but I think we're looking at drivers beyond the organizations that have the problem and more uh, the individuals and the communities that are seeing the problem from their perspective. What a great question. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, we can't include patients enough, right? Like, I, I, I firmly believe that um, Again, I'm not saying this as a ministry spokesperson, but I, I do feel, for as an outsider still, sometimes, that the distance between the policy-making function and the practical delivery of services is too great. Um, you know, around Bob Bell's executive table, there aren't any physicians, for example, out of the bottom. Um, there aren't any people with business experience either, like real private sector business experience other than me. So you have, it's, you know, lots of smart, hardworking people but as an organizational capability, it, it feels very distant from the practice of medicine. And I'm not a doctor, so I don't say that factually, it just feels like it. So for example, we all have our patient anecdotes about Ontario's health system. Some of them are because of personal experience or experience of the loved ones. They do matter. You know, we're all patients for goodness sake. But but I continually see, and I think you probably see this too, that somehow that's dismissed as anecdotal. And so the only way that the patient experience, the, I think, you know, prefaces this by saying up until recently, kind of got itself to that table was through some data generation exercise. And, and I just, you know, I hate to say this, but if you were running a health service delivery business for profit, in other words, your livelihood, your existence depended on patient outcomes and satisfaction, you would never rely on ISIS-generated data to determine whether or not you're hitting your mark. And uh, so I'm not the only one who thinks that. I know Bob thinks that. He, he would never be able to say it that way, so please don't suggest that I'm attributing words to him. You are being recorded, though, right? <laughs> As long as people know that I'm not saying what this is Bob did. We're kidding. Bob did. Bob created the Patient Family Advisory Council. Uh, we selected, well, he selected Julie Drury as the head. Julie sits on our executive team. And now we're into that place where the patient voice is not just consulted or you know, included as a token effort. 
She's part of the policy making function. And that's now where you start to get to the place that, uh, that patients' views are informing the delivery of healthcare in a meaningful way. I have an informal advisory group. I have a patient uh, person, a patient representative who's very experienced in different chronic disease areas um, on our team, right? And it's, and it's for the policy making purpose. Now, having said all that, we could be doing better. And one of the things John and I have talked about on the Health Technologies Fund is how can we get a bigger patient voice on the expert panel, on the identification of which ones of the which one of these innovations will actually work? What about the assessment of the uh, of the previous rounds? You know, as we go around and look at their milestones, how can the patient voice be stronger there? Or how can so, the patient voice be stronger on the teams themselves and in the projects? The implementation um, through and through. Yeah. So. So look, I'm not saying I've done it perfectly at all, but I think what Bob's done is really cool. Julie's amazing. If you haven't heard from Julie, you know, talk to her, um, and uh, and we could do a better job. So again, it's sort of in the category of I'm always open for suggestions. I, the part that impressed me that was really cool was okay, you're talking about the demand driver, but you know, you're hearing from systems. You know, one in an older version, the speech, the original version. There was some, you know, segment that said, kind of a call out to people in the crowd saying, you know who the change agents are? Well, you are. Like, you're all patients in the system. Ultimately, patients will be the drivers of change. And then somebody said to me when I presented this in a relatively intimate group, and it was more of a discussion, you know, a senior health leader in the country, he said, look, I hear you. It's hard to argue intellectually that patients would be the drivers of change. But here's the harsh reality. For whatever reason, Patients in Canada, it was a Canadian perspective, are tolerant of a system in a way that they would never be tolerant of a Starbucks or an Indigo or you know an Amazon online. I mean, for whatever getting their hair cut again, um, for whatever reason, as patients in the aggregate, we all seem to have been worn down to this place where we're kind of yeah, it's okay, right? It's not bad. I know that if I'm really an extremist, or a loved one is, it'll get sorted out. But all the stuff on technology that's now 20 years behind other parts of the world, we're all like, nah, it's okay. I'll go to the specialist, and I know that he or she doesn't come in until quarter of the nine, that it's booked appointments from eight o'clock, and we'll be three hours behind by three. Literally, that was one of my examples. Yeah, you know, it's all right. We'll leave work early. So, but that's, so that was interesting to me because that's a bit of the flip side. Like I can't really rely on that mantra that patients will be the drivers of change. Like I was looking. So I, 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 we got to figure out a way to include the patient voice more, principally in the policy making function, not just experientially. And I'm open to ideas. So just one very small comment to build on what Bill said, and um, I see or we see a lot of parallels between. How you how organization thinks about innovation and how organization thinks about patient family engagement. So, from a strategic planning perspective, you know, there's so many parallels in terms of what you want to accomplish. How do you need to build it into the culture of organization? How do you need to build it into the design and you know um, evidence feeding into strategy, feeding into senior management, feeding that back down to the front line of care. Um, innovation needs to be a thread, much just the way patient and family engagement needs to be a thread running through every aspect. So I would turn it back also in HSN and, and ask, uh, you know, have you reflect on how are you currently approaching patient and family engagement? How are you currently approaching innovation? Um, and what could you learn from each other or strengthen or, or bring together on those two fronts in terms of the way your organization works? Because uh, they should really almost go hand in hand if we want to be you know, successful as care providers in this system. And yeah, what a great point. And, and what a great opportunity to do it as you do your strategic uh, planning exercise. Uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of beg and plead that you include uh, innovation as a strategic pillar. Um, and, and, I, and John's point is spot on. That's a great point. You know, you see such a correlation between patient and family engagement and, uh, and innovation. Um, you know, one thing, just, to, just so I don't miss it, um, on your strategic plan, uh, one of the, 
uh, I love this job, and one of the days that I didn't love the job so much was I think I saw the third strategic deck in a row hit the executive leadership team table. Uh, and so strategy, right? So by definition, forward-looking and overarching. And it's still, there are three of them, I don't tell you which ones they were, three of them that didn't refer to innovation or technology at all. They, they're only two pillars, that's the metaphor that I use, were beds and staffing. So some version of capital and people. Um, and, I, and there's just not another enterprise on the planet, social enterprise, not-for-profit, charity, or profit, that doesn't fundamentally have intertwined in its delivery um, the, the, the optimal investment and execution of innovation, technology, and processes. So I would, I would kind of, uh, that would be one bit to really ask HSN as it embarks on this process, is to, to please don't be scared by the system around you. Be, be the driver of change and, and be the one that says innovation, the adoption scaling of innovation into our system has to be paramount in the second decade of the 21st century. It's more than care management. That would be awesome to see that. And patient engagement would be a big part of it. Bill, that's a great point to end on. I think we've got... Um a small dose of uh, influence and thought in the room here that you've given us this evening. Um, before we thank you, I just want to make sure that people uh, understand or would consider staying back before we dis just after we disconnect. Um, if people could stay back for just a few minutes, I want to have a, run a, a bit of a debrief. And so um, please do stay. If you can't stay and you want to leave your thoughts, please leave them on the cards and drop them in the box uh, on the table. Uh, so without further uh, ado, I, I would like to thank both of you, first of all, for um, your can-do attitude today. It was a little daunting in terms of how we'd get, um, get you plugged in, but um, you guys didn't skip a beat, and I really appreciate the efforts that you took to make this happen for us this evening. So um, we will disconnect from you at this point after a round of applause, and we'll see you again at 7 a.m. Um, same place. Uh, uh, same channel, uh, we'll, we'll just be on the uh, AM dial rather than the PM dial. So thank you very much for your time tonight. If we could just disconnect and then thanks again and we'll see you in the morning. Okay.